in our collaboration with uh, Cedars, not only do we have one, but we have two uh, radiation oncologists who are leaders nationally and internationally in how to utilize immunotherapy and radiation, not just for melanoma, but other solid tumors. I'd like to call up Anthony Nguyen, MD, PhD, who's come uh, to the Department of Radiation Oncology, but we steal him in medical oncology all the time with uh, great ideas about how not just to cryoablate, but to re use radiation to ablate tumors, not just focally, but systemically. So Dr. Nguyen, please. So um, I'd like to thank Dr. Hermit and Dr. Ferries for bringing us all here together with support from AIM. And uh, I'm the token radiation oncologist, uh, like doc Dr. Ferries is a token surgical oncologist. Um, I was putting together this slide deck and really made me think about why I went to radiation oncology. And as a third year medical student at the Dana-Farber, we saw a patient with multiply recurrent melanoma to the neck. And we really had a multidisciplinary discussion with the medical oncologist, the surgeon, and the radiation oncology team about what to do. We ended up deciding to irradiate the neck and he remains disease free to this date. And um, that's why I went to radiation oncology. But this morning we actually had a, a say, I had a same conversation with a patient in a similar position who had surgery and he remains disease free 10, 12 years out now. And so that really highlights the fact that there's no one size fits all picture for patients with melanoma. And so um, this is the agenda today. Um, the first thing, we'll just talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of where radiation therapy fits into the management paradigm of melanoma as we know in 2024. But then more excitingly, as, as a person who runs a tumor immunology lab, we'll talk about the future applications about where radiation and immunotherapy may fall into the melanoma paradigm in the future and possibly in other solid tumors. And so um, the issue with radiation and melanoma is that it's had a fickle history. And so the foundation of radiation biology or radiation therapy actually began in a Petri dish. And so we, back in the 1970s or 1980s, we would take tumor cells, treat them with radiation and see how many cells live after a certain amount of radiation. And what they found in those studies is that uh, the melanoma cells in a dish are highly radio resistant. And so that means it takes a lot, a, a higher amount of radiation to kill the same amount of cells compared to other tumors, such as breast cancer or even other skin cancers like squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, such work has been done to really understand why these tumors are so radio resistant, maybe due to the intrinsic biology or the fact that it can repair DNA damage at a faster level than other tumor types. And this moniker about melanoma being radio resistant has somewhat followed its pathway here into 2024. Um, now, to overcome this intrinsic radio resistance, I think it, it leads that we need more radiation dose to be delivered to the tumor. And so that was a problem back in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. Here's an image of a child being treated um, at Stanford uh, back in 1957. And the initial radiation therapies were quite crude. Um, basically, we're treated with a single field or multiple fields exposing uh, the vast majority or of normal tissue to, uh, to the radiation. But here in 2023, um, the way we deliver radiation has dramatically evolved to the fact that it's essentially very, much more precise much more accurate and that allows us to escalate radiation dose to the tumor. This is a patient that I treated with a tonsillar tumor in a very sensitive location that had a neck. We were able to really deliver the appropriate, the right amount of dose while sparing the normal sensitive tissues. And so why is that applicable to melanoma? It's because we can now escalate our dose to the areas we want to escalate and then preserve the, uh, preserve the normal tissue that may be limiting the amount of dose that we deliver. Uh, again, why does this matter for melanoma? Because again, we can really escalate or really treat the areas we want to treat. So these are examples of uh, things like targeting uh, brain mets, lung mets, or even in the spine, but really trying to come the uh, carve the radiation off the normal tissues, and essentially becomes, as we call it, a radiosurgical procedure. Uh, now, just to review uh, the basic indications for where radiation fits in the melanoma paradigm, this is basically a, you know the nuts and bolts, but uh, surgery remains the de definitive therapy management 
for managing uh, localized melanoma in patients with who are medically inoperable or for which radi uh, surgery may be uh, medically, uh, 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 they may be able to under uh, not undergo surgery, then radiation may be considered. Um, for the primary site, if you have a tumor that's either desmoplastic or has extensive neurotropism, where we think that there may be high risk of recurrence, then we may consider uh, radiation to the primary site. Um, and then when we think about uh, patients with nodal disease, uh, we often consider radiation as well. Um, in a randomized trial, it's shown that actually the adjuvant radiation to the lymph node areas can actually reduce the risk of an infield nodal recurrences. And so we often consider radiation in patients with high risk features, and that may include tumors that have extended beyond the capsule of the lymph node or patients with extensive nodal burden, that means patients with more than one parotid lymph node or multiple cervical, inguinofemoral, cervical, or, um, or lymph nodes. And so, and then lastly, I think also the foundation of, of radiation oncology is in palliating patients as well. And so for patients with metastatic disease that are, are symptomatic or at high risk of becoming symptomatic, that we can consider radiation to those sites. And so that may be, delivering radio surgery to limited brain mets, or maybe delivering uh, stereotactic body radiotherapy to painful uh, painful spine mets or other visceral mets. And so now, uh, now that we've gone through the nuts and bolts of uh, where radiation stands in the melanoma paradigm in 2024, uh, we can talk about a, a topic that actually is more interesting to me, and that's where we think the field of radiation and immunotherapy may come in the future. And so why do, what's the rationale for combining immunotherapy and radiotherapy? Well, the fact is that uh, the full efficacy of radiation requires an intact immune system. And so it's been shown by studies from the 1970s and here also by Dr. Xiao back in 2015, that when you deplete the, when you deplete T cells out of an animal, uh, the fact is that radiation doesn't work as efficaciously. And so it requires an intact immune system and specifically the function of T cells to really carry out the tumor killing that's, that extends beyond the intrinsic tumor killing processes of focal radiation. And so because this process is so dependent on T cells, it made sense that if you can unlock or take off the brakes off T cells with immunotherapy, this can be a natural enhancing partner. And so um, I, I like to I like to use this slide um, uh, to ask uh, if anybody knows who that uh, marble bus is. Of I know a few of you guys know the answer to this, but uh, this is always uh, a, a real uh, real real question. Does anybody know? That's a good guess. It's not Medusa. It's something from Greek mythology. So that's that's Helen of Troy. So. That was the face that launched a thousand ships. And so I like to actually use that, that analogy because this is the study that launched a thousand clinical trials of immunotherapy and radiotherapy. And so this was the original post out paper from the New England Journal in 2012, showing that co combining radiation and immunotherapy could generate this abscopal response. And so by focally irradiating a single site, with radiation, the combination with immunotherapy can produce a distant site in an unirradiated site, suggesting that there's this evidence of synergy between the two. And what, what folks often don't realize is in this trial, um, similar to the trial that Dr. Sullivan, uh, the more modern trial that Dr. Sullivan presented, this was a patient that was already, already responding to immunotherapy, um, but it ultimately progressed. Um, then they received focal radiation to um, a lung, a lung nodule, and that led to uh, a continued response to immunotherapy. So in essence, they were rejuvenating or reinvigorating a, a response that was previously there, but potentially had changed over the course of time. And they did some fantastic immune correlates showing that upon receipt of this focal radiotherapy to a lung site, you were actually generating an increase in uh, T cell response and a decrease in immunosuppressor cells known as myeloid-derived suppressor cells. And so uh, that, um, that was a fantastic trial. But since then, I think, like I mentioned, the, the, the trial that launched a, th a thousand trials 
uh, the results of combining immunotherapy and radiotherapy have been mixed. Um, and in fact, I think uh, the, much of the negative studies have been done, have, much of the negative trials have been done in the head and neck space. But that being said, I think you can lose the battle, but you can't lose the war. And so what we've learned from these trials is that uh, because head and neck cancers often require a lot of radiation to the draining lymph nodes, we actually know now that potentially radiating the lymph nodes may be blunting an immune response that's generated by the combination of radiotherapy and immunotherapy. Uh, beyond that, and that's really informed the next generation of how clinical trials are designed, combining these two treatment modalities. But in the, matter, the fact of the matter is that there actually have been many, there actually have been a handful of successes where radiation and immunotherapy can generate synergy. And this has been demonstrated in multiple phase three trials. The first one is in, uh, in the Pacific trial for locally advanced uh, non-small cell lung cancer, where adjuvant durvalumab can actually improve outcomes in patients who've received uh, chemo radiation. And then more recently in a phase two trial from MD Anderson, where after patients receive ablative radiotherapy to a lung tumor, the addition of immunotherapy actually improved outcomes in, in, in the long term. And so this is a new hope that we can better, potentially do more logically design trials for these in the future. And in fact, um, indicating, you know, suggesting that we recently actually uh, had a, uh, we actually recently had a workshop at the NCI where we brought together thought leaders of radiation oncology, medical oncology, surgical oncology, and industry together to really think about what are the best ways to combine immunotherapy with radiotherapy. Um, this actually happened back in January, and we really answered three, or really brought up three major questions. The first one is, you know, for the past 10 years, we've been really thinking about these two treatment modalities as working additively or synergistically. But I think with the preponderance of data in front of us, we have to really consider the fact that they actually may be even acting antagonistically. And that's something that we have to overcome. The second question really related to the type, the tumors that we really want to look at, the targets that we want to go after, and the timing of the treatment involved. And, and so I'll talk a little bit about the timing later as a really important question. And the final thing is, what are the appropriate clinical endpoints for these trials? Um, you know, we often like to think of overall survival <coughs> as the gold standard clinical trial endpoint. The fact of the matter is, in, in many patients with solid tumors, the progression-free survival or events-free survival is just as critically important in delaying the treatment, delaying going down for the lines of systemic therapy. And so the first lesson uh, is that basic science is the key to advancing immunotherapy, radiotherapy combinations in melanoma and other solid cancers. And um, to highlight that, I think uh, on the far left-hand side, we really think, you know, when we think of in the far left-hand side, we just look at some flow, uh, some how we used to characterize the immune system. And this was basically done with cell surface markers where we try to look at how these markers can correlate with immune response. But now in 2024, we now have a wealth of new technology to really understand the immune response at a very granular single cell level. And so this is through done through single cell RNA sequencing or even spatial transcriptomics, where we can look at not just you know uh, uh, the immune system as a whole, but we can actually look at the granular patterns of gene expression of individual immune cells that really really um, tell us how things respond to immunotherapy and radiation. And one of the ways that basic science has really changed our practice, or at least here at Cedar Sinai was uh, one of the studies that showed that actually that the microenvironment of liver metastases was actually potentially blunting a response to immunotherapy. And so this is work done out of the University of Michigan, but basically showing that macrophages or the micro macrophages within liver metastases were actually impairing responses to immunotherapy. And so now moving forward, you know, we uh, collaborate with Dr. Hamid and Dr. Ferries and we consider ablative radiotherapy to patients with liver metastases to potentially, uh, you know, overcome these uh, immunosuppressive signals. Uh, and in fact, similarly, uh, building on that concept, um, at that NCI workshop, we had a competition for who could come up with the best clinical trial. And uh, not to tell my own horn, but we actually came up with the top, the top trial, which was combining liver SBRT with immunotherapy to try to really rejuvenate or reinvigorate a response 
to PD one blockade and we uh we won some Wisconsin cheese heads for that uh for that for that prize. The less the second lesson is that timing is everything. And so this you know of course doesn't apply to you know everything in the world, but also to immunotherapy and radiotherapy. And work that you know I've done with Stephen Chow basically shows that you know the immune system actually responds at a very time dependent manner to act whether to time dependent manner after you see radiation. Radiation isn't just a tumor killing event, but it also induces a de novo immune response that could potentially serve as an instigator of T cell recruitment to the local tumor microenvironment. And so, as Dr. Amit mentioned in his in his opening talk, that there are some tumors that don't have that level of T cells that are present that are required to mount an immune response to PD-1 blockade. And so we think that radiotherapy can serve as that appropriate instigator in the right context. Um, and then again, timing is everything. And we talked about, we I alluded to this early in the talk, but one of the issues also is when to give the radiation with immunotherapy. And the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of trials or the initial trials have looked at concurrent immunotherapy and radiation. Uh, but if we were actually to go back to basic radiobiology principles, we actually know that T cells are quite radiosensitive. They're the first cells to die. And so by ablating, by treating the lymph nodes, you actually may be ablating a response that was already there previously with immunotherapy. And so there's been fantastic work doing this, and this is a rapidly evolving space. And the, until this point, um, you know, Dr. Xiao actually ran a, a, a neoadjuvant trial of immunotherapy and SBRT or radiation in early stage triple negative breast cancer. And they did some immune, immune correlates from this work. And what they found was interestingly that based on the baseline phenotype or the baseline microenvironment of these tumors, we can predict which patients would have already responded already. The patients, the most favorable patients already had pre-existing anti-tumor immunity or were able to mount a maximal immune response to, to this combination therapy. And so um, I think there needs to be more work to really understand how we actually can convert the final category of patients, which were the patients with a highly immu uh, suppressive immuno microenvironment. And I think we're, that those are things that we're doing in the lab right now. And the last thing, the last lesson is that we potentially need better combinations or better targets on top of immunotherapy, radiotherapy backbone. And, uh, you know, we've, there's been some fantastic work looking at T-cell-based checkpoints, but as a person who's very interested in macrophages and innate immunity, I think there's a whole host of other immune cells in addition to, you know, NK cells and T-cells that we haven't really fully taken advantage of. And in fact, these cells also have their own checkpoints or breaks that are limiting the activity. And we actually find that, um, you know, other groups and us, we find that we, when we target some of these checkpoints, we can actually augment a response to radiotherapy. And in fact, in our data, we show that actually by targeting some of these innate immune cells or non T cell base, such as neutrophils or myeloid derived suppressor cells, we can actually unlock a level of new anti-tumor immunity and actually instigate T cell recruitment, uh, expressing several markers of central memory that were not fully uh, present prior to treatment. And so in, in conclusion, um, you know, I think we, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the uh, basic radio resistance of melanoma, but the fact that modern techniques can actually overcome some of these hurdles in terms of incorporating, better incorporating radiation into the melano current melanoma paradigm. We talk about how adjuvant radiation should be considered in patients with high-risk features, but that this is obviously a, you know, an ongoing conversation, a careful conversation that requires multidisciplinary input from the surgical oncologist, the medical oncologist, and the radiation oncologist. And then we talked about, again, something that's near and dear to my heart, which is how do you use radiation to potentially overcome resistance to immunotherapy and reinvigorate a, a response to radiation? So this was a patient from that triple negative breast cancer trial where we patient was treated with focal radiotherapy to the circle in red with immunotherapy. And then that focal treatment was actually able to produce a systemic response outside of the field. And so um, there's much exciting work to be done to really understand the next iterations of these targets. but um, 
with that, uh, you know, I'm happy to take any questions, but I'd like to acknowledge our radiation oncology department, uh, several folks in the lab are funding sources. And again, just a wonderful and close collaboration with Dr. Hamid, Dr. Ferries, and the rest of the Angeles team. Thank you.